Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by three of my colleagues today. Uh, we've got, uh, of course, our, my co-host, Ryan Sweet. Ryan's the Director of Real-Time Economics, and Chris, Chris Dorides, who is the Deputy Chief Economist. And we've also got Gaurav, Gaurav Ganguly. Uh, this, I believe Gaurav is your second appearance on Inside Economics. Is that, do I have that right? Something like that. Yeah, Grav is, uh, is uh, hailing from, where are you hailing from today, Grav? London. London, yeah, because we're going to talk about Europe, um, the thinking being that, you know, recession's on the mind, uh, a lot of concern about that here in the U.S., but if the U.S. is headed towards recession, it feels like Europe will get there faster, so we want to, we want to get Grav's take on that what's going on in Europe and, you know, whether uh, sending out any early warning signals for U.S. recession. Uh, but before we get to all of that, uh, well, for, first I should say, just because it's increasingly tradition, I got to, you know, say something about each of the guests. Uh, uh, Chris, where are you? You are still on vacation, aren't you? I am. I'm in Italy. You're still in Italy. Okay. Yeah, but I've moved a little bit. I'm in central Italy now. Oh, really? Which, which do you like better, northern or central Italy? Well, it's, uh, it's pretty hot right now. There's a heat wave going on. So uh, the north was a little, uh, little nicer this time around. But both are, everyone's everywhere in Italy is beautiful. So. Yeah, it's a great country. I really love Italy. That's why Europe won't go into a recession in the next week because Chris yeah. is there spending all his Bitcoin uh, money. You know, <laughs> all his excess savings. <laughs> yeah. Excess Bitcoin? I don't know. Uh, Actually, I have a, a great... lot of that going around. <laughs> I have a great story about Italy. It took home with my brother and uh, we, uh, our daughters, so, so uh, the five of us, and we, uh, we we went into this. We were looking for. We we're driving to. I'm not sure where, and we uh, needed. A, we wanted a restaurant. We figured, well, the restaurant, all the good restaurants are at the top of a hill. So we start driving up this road that's going straight up to the top of the hill, and then it turns into like. A sidewalk, but we keep going. <laughs> that was a huge <laughs> I could, I could still see the face of all these Italians looking at. Me. They're like, "What the hell are you doing? Where are you going?" <laughs> so I had to stop and come back down the mountain. So going, we found a restaurant someplace, but yeah, good memory. Anyway, so it's it's warm in Italy. It's also warm in uh, Pennsylvania, right, uh, Ryan? But you're in your you're in your sweatshirt. What's that all about? It's, it's still early in the morning. You know, later today when I take the kids to the pool, I'll, I'll put a t-shirt on, but you're still, you haven't had your coffee and everything. I don't drink coffee. Unlike you, like you and Chris. Coffee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's the problem. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And of course, Garav, I, the thing about Garav is, he, you know, he looks younger every time I see him. I don't know what the hell that's all about. Uh, it's just because I have these pins and I keep stretching the skin and pinning them to the back of my yeah, head. Yeah, you're doing really well. Yeah. You know, you definitely, we're not working you hard enough. I, that's maybe <laughs> it's just not doing its job wearing you down. Yeah, yeah, but I've got to you plug me a bit harder. All right, and okay, well, we've got a great gang here. So, and this is uh, uh, July Fourth uh, weekend. So, I don't know that this will be a long podcast, but it'll be a good one. So. Uh, before we dive into things, maybe we'll have Ryan give us a sense of the GDP numbers. I mean, usually we don't talk, this is a third, so-called third print. So we're, you know, we're still focused on Q1 2022, and this will be the third release of the GDP number. And they've got, it's gotten revised and the revisions this time are pretty large with some pretty significant implications. Is that right, Ryan? Do I have that right? Well, I mean, the revision was small overall for total GDP. So it was revised lower from minus 1.5% an annualized decline to minus 1.6. But that kind of masked a lot of revisions within the components. They were just offsetting, but there were some enormous revisions to uh, consumer spending. Uh, and it kind of alters the trajectory of spending. We're now basically moving sideways, whereas before you know, we, were, we were trending higher and that kind of you know, bodes ill for the near-term outlook. Also inventories were revised up a lot roughly 40 billion at an annualized rate. So the inventory build in the first quarter is now close to 189 billion at an annualized rate. That's, that's an enormous inventory build. And that makes Q2 even more difficult because the way they uh, account for inventories in GDP, it's the change in the change in inventories that matters. So we have to get at least 188 billion increase in inventories in the second quarter 
for inventories just to be neutral for third or second quarter GDP growth. And that's not going to happen. So inventories are going to be a big weight on uh, GDP again. Yeah, that, I was surprised by the size of that revision to consumption. So basically what they figured, BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis, the folks that put the data together, figured out was that we people actually consumed less and more of that ended up in inventory. That's effectively what happened here. Correct. Although the Is biggest it? revisions were, were was, was it revisions to spending, consumer spending across all kinds of all categories or was it Mm -hmm. Constant was that mostly services that or was it more broadly than that? I think it was more broadly than that. More broadly, that would be overall okay, so that spending. Would be yeah, overall spending added one point two percentage points to first quarter first quarter GDP, and that's down from two point one percentage point contribution in the government's second estimate. So that's that's a massive revision to spending. Yeah. So it, it if nothing else changes, given this now much larger inventory gain in Q one. Uh, which means in all likelihood inventories are going to be a pretty sizable drag in Q2, the current quarter, mm -hmm. or the just ended current quarter, right? We just, this is July 1st. Uh, that, what does that mean for GDP growth in the second quarter? So our tracking estimates, we have this yeah. high frequency GDP model that takes all the source data that's released you know, throughout the quarter. And every day we run it and it tells you what current quarter GDP is tracking based on all the information that we have. Now, we don't have all the data for June yet, but uh, after the GDP number came out, we were at close to 1% at an annualized rate. That got docked, knocked down to half a percentage point. And then the monthly uh, personal income and spending data came out, and that put us negative. So we're now on track Ooh. to decline minus 0.2% at an annualized oh, rate. Oh, okay. Right. The other folks that do a good job of this uh, creating these tracking estimates is the Atlanta Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. similar kind of approach. What What is their estimate? Minus 1%. Oh, right goodness. There. So odds are, feel like they're pretty high. We're going to get a negative Q2 on GDP on top of the negative Q1 that we got. Correct. Ooh. Atlanta Fed model does a really good job. It just sometimes overstates some of the moves because they use more services or survey-based data that isn't exactly an input into the, uh, the source data. Ours is really like a bean counting approach, but typically our, our, four, our models go in the same direction. So this is not a good sign. Hmm. So in Europe, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but in Europe, if you had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, that would be called a recession, would it not? That would be called a technical recession. Yes. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the sort of statistic that you know, newspapers focus on. And it looks like you guys might get the ahead of us because we had about, in the Eurozone, we had about 0.3 percentage points growth in Q1. And Q2 doesn't look too great, to be honest. Um, you know, Eurozone industrial production, retail sales month on month declined in April. Latest confidence, business confidence is pretty weak. BMI has fallen below 50. New orders don't look too great. So the pipeline doesn't look too good. Consumer confidence has been absolutely shocking. So Q2, we'd be lucky to post a positive number in, in the Eurozone, at least. Um, UK might even post a negative number, by the way. Um, so we're clearly sort of on the edge there in, in the UK. UK posted a positive number in Q1. But Eurozone might just scrape by, despite everything that's going on, which which feels a bit odd. Um, Chris spending all his money in Italy means that Q, you know that's going to keep us above water in Q2. But actually, all the other tourists who go on holiday in Europe in Q3 should keep Europe well above water in Q3. And then we get into some fairly uncertain and I, you know, from where I'm sitting, it looks fairly dark times in Q4 and Q5, um, Q4 of this year and Q1 of next year. Q5, that would be kind of cool. Q5, that'd yeah. be good. That'd be good. Yeah. That, 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 might, that might, I don't know. Bring no, that uh, on. Non, we, non need a bonus, adjusted, we need a non bonus. We need a bonus quarter. Adjusted basis, <laughs> non working the adjusted basis, GDP would be up big time. You know, I've heard this term Many times, technical recession, particularly in Europe. What is what does that mean exactly? Technical. Recession? Oh, that's interesting. I, I I thought I thought you guys had that over in the U.S. as well because I was quite surprised by this. This came out, I don't know, maybe a decade ago or so. I started noticing that newspapers, like you know, Financial Times, whatever, the big broadsheets, they were carrying this term. So two quarters of Q1, Q negative prints of GDP growth would be something that call a technical recession. I don't know, maybe that just makes it easier for the readership to grasp rather than 
the classical economics, you know, the Burns and Mitchell style business cycle definition of a recession, which is so broad based and something you can only really fix on quite long after the event. In the US, there's the, the dating committee, right? The MBER, yeah. National Bureau of yeah. Economic Research uh, Dating, you know, right? What is it? Yeah. Five well, that's what goes back to Burns decide. and Mitchell, right? Right. That's what goes back so to Burns UK, and Mitchell in 1947 in, and all that. And yeah, so yeah in the UK, in Europe, there is no... Yeah. Oh, they're, no, no, they no, have they're, the same. They're, they're, they're formal, formal dating committees and they will expose data recession. Um, and those are, of course, very similar in style and contents to the NBER dating system. Um, it's just that in the popular press, you get to see this concept. You, see, you, you hear a lot about this concept of a technical recession. Yeah, I mean, it feels like we're going to be debating here now whether we're in recession and been in recession since the beginning of the year. Yeah, we'll, we'll be debating it, but the press is just going to be yeah, all I over guess, this. They're, they're already yeah. writing about a technical recession. So this is how we're going to use the word. Ourselves. Do they use that word technical recession? People are saying that. Yeah, this morning. Textbook. Textbook recession. Yeah, textbook. Now, oh, is that what they're saying? Textbook recession? This morning they used I think, technical. Who, who's they? Like uh, Wall Street Journal? They? Uh, or? Bloomberg. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, but technical I mean. Technical recession is typically what they say in Europe um, to capture this concept. Mm -hmm. they, they call it a technical recession, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but as we've been discussing, that we don't think that the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Business Cycle Dating Committee of the NBER, which is, I think we've all kind of sort of agreed is the official arbiter of our business cycle here in the U.S. We don't think they're going to date this period as the U.S. being in recession. No. Uh, how, how could they when you're creating 400,000 jobs a month? Right. I mean, right. the only weakness is really in GDP, and that's subject to enormous revisions. Right. Yeah, and it feels like this could be really revised a lot when you get the annual benchmark revisions, right? I guess mm -hmm. the other thing to consider here, we, this is the third print on Q1, but there's also these annual, more comprehensive benchmark revisions. And then they've got like a even bigger set of revisions, every the BEA to these studies, I think every three years, don't they? I believe mm -hmm. that's the case. And so given the, the what's going on with this data and given a lot of it around, is around inventory, feels in trade, which is hard to measure it real certainly in, in real time, it feels like there could be massive revisions here to this data. It feels like it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Right. The other implication actually that of all this is if GDP is declining and we're creating a lot of jobs, product this, you know, by by definition, productivity growth is getting hammered here, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. okay. All right. Well, uh, before we go on, uh, let's uh, let's play the game. Let's play the statistics game. Um, and I'll, I will admit, I'm ill prepared for this week, but I, I know you guys are on top of it. But the game. Are you, are you on ahead. vacation? No, no, I'm, I'm not. You know, I've been working. Oh, I think we just lost Chris. Uh, I, you know, I've been working, but uh, I, I this just got away from me somehow mm. uh, <laughs> to prepare for the statistics game. But I do have one. I just thought. Right. Of one. A good one, actually. All right. And, and we'll, well, I'm sure Chris will come back. But the, just to remind everyone, and this is uh, for folks that uh, don't follow regularly, I apologize. I know this sounds it's increasingly redundant, but the game is we each uh, provide a statistic. Uh, the rest of us try to figure that out through questions and clues and deductive reasoning. Uh, the best the best statistic is one where it's not so easy that we get so that we all get it quickly, not too hard, so we never get it. And is a statistic that is related to what's going on recently would be, or a topic at hand would be uh, a bonus. So with that, um, let me uh, turn to you, uh, Chris. Are you on the line, or do, do we get you back? I am. Can you hear me? I... Yeah, you you sound great. Okay. Uh, why don't you okay. go first, just in case we lose you again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, three numbers, all related, 8.6%, 22%, and 6.5%. And is it based on a, is it coming from a, an economic release that came out this week, this past week? Y yes. Is it inflation related? It is. So one of them is the S&P, or the Case-Shiller house price index. Nope. No. Nope. Mm. Some of them sound suspiciously like 
June Eurozone annual inflation rate. You got it. You know oh, that the other two are? That's well, just 8.6. That's me done. 8. Point. <laughs> yep, it's <laughs> Eurozone. So, that was, it, that was also easy numbers? because Chris is in Italy. Oh, right. He's adding to the inflationary pressures. <laughs> but what is 8.6? What, what is that? That's the June Euros uh, June print on Eurozone inflation year on year. Oh, year on year, uh, yeah. comparable to like consumer price inflation. That's right. So it was yeah, 8.1% right. in May, and it's just gone up to 8.6%. Which, by the way, is exactly equal to the US CPI inflation print for the mo month of May, which is interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What's the second number, Chris? 22%. 22%. It's, it's related. They're all related. Is that what uh, energy prices are? No, that would be even more. No, so is it, is it a component of the CPI that's up 22% in Europe? No, not, no. not really. You see how he delayed that? Uh, I mean, yeah, is that 22%? It's, it's getting close. It's getting close. Uh, it's not a direct component. It's not a. Uh, it's is not it another problem. country? It is. Very good. Oh. What right. are the Baltics? Yes, which one? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got one third. I've got one third chance of getting this right. Yeah. <laughs> I like Lithuania. Just... I'm going with Lithuania. No. Estonia. Estonia. Okay. Estonia. Twenty two percent over year. Inflation's up and that then... much in Estonia? Yeah. So yes. across all three Baltics actually, inflation is yeah. really okay. high right now. Why? Energy. That's right. Um, yeah, so they're very exposed to Russia. They import a lot yeah. of energy from Russia. They export a lot of goods to Russia. They've had a massive supply side shock as a result of all the sanctions. Mm. Wow. That makes sense. And conversely, okay. conversely, there's another country that's at 6.5%. That's France. Just to show you the range. That's France. Very good. Wow. Well, that is very good. It's gone up from 5.4% to 6.5%. And by the way, I'm not showing off anything, but that's because they've got all these tariffs. They've, they've got all these... Um, um, Exemptions have got like a 18, 18 cent um, subsidy on fuel, on, on petrol, and they've got caps on electricity prices. And uh, they most. produce a lot of their own nuclear yeah. power. So. Yeah, well, that, that helps them because in, uh, there's, of course, an internal electricity market in, in Europe. So everybody mm -hmm. gets the same marginal cost at the wholesale level, at the retail level, because France produces so much nuclear the French government can get away with putting a cap on electricity prices. No, oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so that was that was a really good one, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And it, it, you know, it does highlight a point, a broader point, that inflation is high everywhere across the planet. It, it's not just the U.S. It's everywhere uh, we're seeing that. And that goes to the debate around what's causing the inflation, whether it is... The high inflation, whether it's demand side or supply side, you know, is it something? Right. If it's demand side, then you see much bigger differences in inflation across the world. But since we're seeing similar inflation rates across the world, that suggests it's supply side, and there's two obvious supply side shocks: the pandemic and obviously the Russian war in Ukraine. Did, did, did is that exactly? You, you came to the same conclusion, right, Rob? Do you do you, that's right. Do you is that consistent with your thinking too? But this is yeah, that's, that's largely exactly supply side. Here. Yeah, that's exactly what we see. Here. Partially yeah. supply side, and then, um, well, it's it's, go it's going to be interesting how this plays out. I think how much disinflationary pressure we see going forward um, because of these high prices that are really eating into consumer disposable income. So in the UK, for instance, they, they, there's an unprecedented squeeze in consumer disposable income, and that's coming through now. We can see um, retail spending going down. And with the Bank of England raising rates, you know, that's another squeeze on households. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, yeah, and this goes back to the recession, uh, potential for a recession. Uh, it, it, the, 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 the proximate reason for recession is, is, is the inflation. And that works in two, there are many different ways that hurts the economy and raises recession risk. So first is what you just mentioned, this kind of negative, income shock, right? So people's real incomes have declined, they have less purchasing power, they pull back on their spending and that raises the odds of recession. Second is the central banks, Fed, BOE, Bank of England, ECB, European Central Bank, are trying to slow the economy's growth rate to come and keep inflation expectations down. So they're raising interest rates and that's the other way 
uh, the key way that this uh, results in higher uh, recession odds. But going back to the real income shock, the thing that confuses me a little bit there uh, is that uh, households here in the US and in the UK and in continental Europe have a fair amount of excess saving, right? That they built up during the pandemic because of sheltering in place and government support. And that should help cushion the blow. But it feels like, or, or maybe I'm just reading too much into the recent data, feels like it's it's not the, as big a cushion as it one would have thought. Is it? it is that your sense of things, Grav? I, I get the sense that there is some cushion. I get the sense okay. that things could be worse than they are right now because actually consumers are holding up pretty well. I also think that they, we might see some of that cushion being released in the third quarter of the year when Europeans go on holiday. So they're paying quite a lot for the holiday tickets right now if they get to go anywhere at all, by the way. So watch out whether, you know, I'm not sure when Chris plans to come back. Uh, get back from Europe to the U.S., but yeah, lights I don't know. He may uh, never absolutely come back. next week. A whole, a whole remote worst thing, you know? But he better get better <laughs> internet connectivity if he's going to uh, stay over there for very long. Yeah, yeah I got to fix this. Yeah. Europeans are looking to go out and spend in summer, so I think some of that cash cushion is going to be used for the for the summer holiday plans. So yeah, I, I think there is some, and I think it is helping. I think things could be worse. So what I'm worried about is when we get into the end of this year and early part of next year, will that cushion still be there? Yeah. I mean, if, if prices stay high, inflation doesn't recede, then at some point, you, every certainly low income households blow through the excess saving. And right. then, and then they got, have no choice but to pull back. And that feels like yeah, rise and, of recession rise. In some countries like the UK, actually low income households didn't get much of a chance to amass extra savings in any case. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, oh, you meant, you said one thing that I found, maybe I heard it, I just want to make sure I heard it right. You're saying that people bought their tickets in Q2, but the real spending is, and that's kind of taken away from their ability to spend in Q2, and, they're, and then they're going to travel in Q3, and that's going to show up in the spending. Is that kind of what you were saying? Uh, so a bit of both. I think people have been spending, they're spending on holidays. So what they bought in Q2, that you know, the tickets that they bought in Q2, that's in Q2 spending, obviously. Yeah. Um, they're going to go out and spend more in Q3, of course. They're going to go to okay. places and you know, wine and dine and, you know, all that sort of stuff. I see. So you're saying the travel showed up in Q2 spending, kept it going a bit, and there's still more coming in Q3 because now they're going to go on the trip. Right. Yeah, got it. All right. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, let's go on to the next uh uh, person in the statistics game. Um, Grab, you want to go next? Yeah, I've got a weird number. I'm, I'm, okay. I, 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 you know, I'm handing out a prize to anyone who gets it, um, which What's is totally against the spirit of. Oh, I don't know. We'll see. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> that's a cowbell. Um, yeah, exactly. A Swiss cowbell. We want to sweep. A Swiss I, cowbell. Yeah, Chris uh, is telling go. me that there's differences yeah. in cowbells. So, Swiss. We'd go for the Swiss cowbell. Um, but it's a number I'm following quite closely <laughs> right now. So it's a, it's 57. A number you're following very closely and it's 57. <laughs> and it's 57 okay. and it's a European, it's a European number. Okay, is it like a-, uh, a I thought it was Heinz measure. ketchup related, but- Yeah, Heinz ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like ketchup, so I'm not following it. You don't okay. like ketchup? That's not <laughs> Who doesn't like ketchup? What the heck? Uh, oh, so this is a European thing. I like mayonnaise. Oh, yeah. That's, Murray, that's don't gross. tell me you put mayonnaise on your french fries. That is gross. I put mayonnaise on my french fries, yes. Oh, yeah. God. That's really. That <laughs> I is don't know. Weird. We're talking 4th of July, though. That's weird. Yeah. Little context. 57. <laughs> is that, is that a confidence measure? It's 57, a consumer confidence measure? No, it's, 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 it's not a confidence measure. It's, no. it's a commodity measure. Oh, a commodity. Oh. Oh, is that yeah. natural gas prices? In, uh... It's close. It's, it's, it is related to natural gas. Oh, it's related to natural gas. <laughs> What's related to natural gas other than inventories natural, gas? natural gas? Huh? It's something to do with natural gas. Yeah, so inventories? Inventories, exactly. Uh, so cowbell, cowbell oh, 57%. Oh, 57%. Oh, yeah, I, should, I should have said that. I should have said 57%. Percent. Sorry. Okay. That's yeah. rude. Two, two, cow, two, two cowbells to Ryan's feet, one each for each of you. Um, so that's 57%. <laughs> that's very that's, diplomatic. That's, Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's that's the amount of gas in storage amount of capacity that's been filled to date in europe oh. and europe has about 
Europe has the ability to store about a quarter of its annual gas consumption. Um, and it does that to even out seasonal peaks. And it's roughly at 57% of capacity right now. What, in, in, oh, and that's so that's uh, more than usual, right? That, that's ahead of schedule. It's that unfortunately can, not actually. If you look back, no? if you look, if you look back to, um, so sort of what happened over year. the course of the year. From la last year was a bad year. Last year was a bad year. That's yeah, right. It's that's ahead right. Of, that's it's ahead right. of last year. But if you look back last ten years, this isn't particularly special. So the European Union actually wants to achieve a target of ninety percent of gas and storage fill up fill up storage to about ninety percent by the first of November, which is the seasonal peak in storage. After that. Um, the net withdrawals from the gas system, from the storage system. 90% of capacity is something Europe has achieved in the past. Um, I don't know if it'll actually manage to achieve that this year. It's an ambitious target. Last year, it certainly didn't, uh, as Chris was saying. Um, what's been happening recently is that Russian gas flows have slowed down considerably uh, coming into Europe. It slowed down anyway in 2021, but actually one of the big pipelines that comes into Germany, Nord Stream 1, capacity in that pipeline, flow in that pipeline is about 40% of capacity right now. So Europe, if it wants to get through uh, next winter, really wants to get about 90% of gas in storage as a buffer, that should help a lot, but it doesn't look like it will achieve that right now. Uh, and of course, it, it, the gas is being impaired by, intentionally by Russia, correct? I mean, they're correct. sending a signal they're sending a signal. They, they, this, they, they're doing what we've been worried about for a long time, which is essentially weaponizing gas. It knows right. that Europe is vulnerable on this front. Right. Um, and what, what is the price of, do you, do you have a sense of the price of natural gas, where it was pre-Russian invasion and where it is today? In so Europe? right now, right now in Europe, it's about 145 euros per megawatt hour. And about a year ago, um, it was closer to 25. So it's been a massive, massive wow. increase in gas prices. Right. And that, of course, natural gas is very key to home heating throughout Europe and a lot of industrial activity, particularly in Germany, which is very dependent on Russian natural gas. Exactly. So, about, so Europe consumes about 400 billion cubic meters of gas a year. 40% of that is for households, uh, for heating purposes and, and heating, cooking, etc. And then another 25% goes to industry. But a lot of that is actually for heating. Um, and about 15% goes to actual industrial processes like in chemicals or cement, steel, et cetera. But the problem is that even where gas is used for process heating in, in industry, you can't really shut down the gas or, or ask people to consume less. Um, so things like precision engineering, actually rooms rooms needed to be heated to a specific temperature for instruments to work, cutting instruments to be at the optimal. So you can't really have one or two degrees less. Right, right. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. So we're at 57% of, of storage capacity. They, the Europeans want to be at 90. And so uh, you're, you're watching that very carefully uh, as a gauge to how vulnerable Europe is when we go into the winter months. To, to exactly. Ru Russian, exactly. uh, yeah, okay, okay. Very are you hearing good. talk of uh, are you hearing talk of rationing? Garf? Yeah, there's a lot I'm of certainly talk hearing about, that here. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of talk about rationing. Um, some of this is just, I guess, ready. Well, a lot of this is actually readiness. I think so. Various countries, all countries, have national gas emergency plans given um, sensitivity to natural gas, and Germany is just. It's got a three-point emergency plan. It triggered the first part of it in March, just after the invasion. It's now triggered the second phase of its national gas emergency plan. All of this doesn't mean that much yet. Um, I mean, there are, there are things that German industry can do under the phase two of its emergency plan, but nobody's doing any of that yet. Uh, phase two basically is a state of heightened alertness when gas prices are incredibly high and there's potential for disruption, but actually markets still manage to clear and uh, supply managers to meet demand. If you get into phase three, that's when gas rationing could occur. And thinking about it, I, you know, it's not clear to me that gas rationing has to be something that immediately follows curtailment of gas supply, because in a way we've been facing disruption for a year and markets have been coping, Europe's been coping, um, and that's where storage comes in. So if there's a fair bit of storage, 
and Russian supply ceases completely, Europe can draw down on its storage rather than seek to ration gas to industry. And that's probably the way it will go. So if it happens at the start of winter, 90% gas in storage, there's a bit of a buffer there. Europe doesn't use up all 90% of its gas just for heating homes in winter. You can easily emerge with 30, 40% of gas still in storage at the end of a winter. So there's some buffer there to, to provide to industry. If it happens now, um, Europe faces a choice. Is it going to ration gas to industry or is it going to slip on its storage target? So again, yeah. it doesn't have to happen immediately. Well, it's also driving up natural gas prices here, right? Because of LNG, liquefied natural gas. So because of the high price in Europe, there's an arbitrage opportunity. So U.S. producers of gas, natural gas want to ship it to Europe, get the higher price. And I think the U.S. has now become the largest exporter of LNG, of liquefied natural gas in the world as a result. But it has pushed up prices here. So n- nothing compared to Europe, but we're paying, last I looked, $6.50 uh, per uh I th- what is it, Ryan? Is it million BTU? I think it's million, million BTU. BTU. Yeah. And, and that's more than double what it was a year ago. So that hasn't really had a big impact here, here but if we stay at these prices going into the winter months, that could be more of a deal um, just because it you know, costs households a lot more. So and remember- Europe needs that LNG. It really needs that LNG from the US right now. Um, so if I look at what's what's happening uh, last last year, Europe imported about 150 billion cubic meters of gas from Russia. It wants to ha- it wants to it wants to get down to about a third of that by the end of this year. So it doesn't want to import more than I don't know 45 billion cubic meters. Uh, it might just do that even with these reduced flows from Russia. Um, so I just estimated that even with these reduced flows from Russia now, Russia could end up sending about 50 billion cubic meters of gas to the rest of to Europe over the course of the rest of this year. So, you know, that would balance it out. It, Europe would have what mm-hmm. it needs, but the rest, it's all really coming from LNG. Europe yeah. needs about 170 billion cubic meters of LNG over 2022 to balance it all out and meet its annual consumption. I guess some also uh, increasing amount will come from the Middle East, right? Or or US and, and Middle East? Some from the Middle East, yes. Okay. Uh, but I mean, the big potential for the Middle East, well, that's a medium term play. I see. Getting Qatari gas on stream and, and sending that over to Europe. That'll take some time. Right. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Ryan, you're up. Uh, what's your statistic of the week? 2.04%. 2.04. Is it an inflation number? Yes. It's related to inflation. Yes. Uh, related to inflation. Is it a commodity price? It is not. Okay. Uh related to inflation uh is it a survey-based measure it is not it is not as a market-based measure it is and okay, i'll give so you context 2.04 okay. okay uh it peaked recently in april close to 2.6 percent it, it okay 2.2.6 percent now 2.04 is it inflation expectations measure mm-hmm. oh is it uh, 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 like a it's not one year five is it five year five year forwards yeah correct good job ah right there you go rob you see how that's done you see that yeah i just slowly whittled, whittled him down yes. yeah <laughs> there's uh, another cowbell there for you mark i want a swiss cowbell though yeah and absolutely you got it switzerland I, I like it from please chris is going to bring them all back <laughs> uh, i'll work on it okay uh, uh, you want to explain the five, where, is this the ice measure, the five year, five year forward, or do you know where you're getting this from or what, what is this? Oh, we calculate it. So oh, we calculate the, it. Yeah. Okay. The Fed paper, but it's also, um, consistent with what you see, you know, in the Bloomberg terminal or any other way of calculating five year, five year forwards. And do you want to just explain what that is? Yeah. So five year, five year forwards are what, uh, the bond market expects inflation five years from now, five years after that to be. So it's a, good measure of long-term inflation expectations. And it's based on the consumer price index. So in fact, it's probably running a little bit below where the Fed would want it to be right now if you adjust it for you know, the personal consumption expenditure. So um, Fed's put a lot of emphasis on inflation expectations. And that's one reason why the Fed went 75 basis points in June instead of 50 is that survey-based measures of uh, inflation expectations had jumped. But you know, I think you and I, Mark and I put a lot more emphasis on the bond market because there's a people putting their money where their mouth is. And basically the market's saying, we're not worried about inflation. If you look at inflation swaps, same story. You know, they expect 
inflation to come down, you know, in the in the medium term. So this yeah. I think this reduces the odds we get another supersized rate hike in July if inflation expectations remain, you know, at the low end of where the Fed will want them to be. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there. I, the measure I find most useful, I'm curious what you think, is the one year, five year forward uh, mm -hmm. from ICE. ICE uh, constructs these inflation expectation measures best based on break evens and swaps. Mm -hmm. So bond market measures, and they combine those two into this one uh, uh, measure and, and I think one year, five year forward. So that's inflation a year from now in the subsequent five year period. And that feels like what the, what the central banks or the Fed has most control over, what they should be most focused on. I think I looked this morning, I did look this morning, it was 2.2%, which is yeah. low, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, to your point. Uh, feels like inflation expectations are exactly where the Fed wants them. By the way, you know, in conducting monetary policy, they, uh, I'm, I'm just going to lay out a little framework. I'm curious how, what you guys think of it, uh, is uh, the, the Federal Reserve and other central banks are trying to raise rates high enough, fast enough to slow growth so that economies don't blow past full employment and exacerbate the inflationary pressures, and more importantly, keep inflation expectations anchored to their target, which is 2% or 2.5%, depending on the measure. Uh, and, uh, the fact that the one year, five year forward or the five year, five year forwards are right where they want to be. They've, they, they're, it feels like they're accomplishing that. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other thing they want to do is not raise rates so high, so fast that it pushes the economy into recession. And the indicator that I think is best at measuring that also bond market related or measured is the yield curve. So the 10 year treasury yield vis-a-vis -vis the two year treasury yield. And that's, that's that difference, that spread typically is, you know, could be 100 basis points, a percentage point. Now, it, yesterday, I think it was three basis points, 0 0.003, you know, percent. It's razor thin. But that, that feels like that's almost perfect, right? Because it hasn't inverted, meaning short rates rising above long rates, because that historically signaled recession. But it's so flat, it suggests the economy is just going to really slow down here not go in recession, but it's really slow down. And that's exactly what they want, right? It achieves mm -hmm. their, their first goal is to slow growth in the economy to the point that, you, you, that we don't blow past full employment. So it feels if you look at these bond market measures, they and if I were sitting there trying to calibrate policy, those are the two measures I'd be looking at. And right now they're saying success. I mean, obviously a lot of script to be written here, but so far so good. What, what do you think of that, that frame? And does that make sense to you what I just said? No, I think, it's, yeah, I think I agree with you. I mean, the bond yeah. market's saying that they're going to pull it off, but we'll they see. said they're going to pull this off. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right, exactly. Maybe, maybe the Fed is looking at those two measures, cal trying to calibrate around those two measures. Yeah, well, we're putting a lot of emphasis on inflation expectations. And I think they've come down. I mean, they came down a lot this week, and commodity prices have sold off. So, wheat prices are down, oil prices are down. Your favorite copper has dropped noticeably. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, moving parts in the commodity market. All right. Chris, what do you think of that frame for thinking about things I mean, in terms of the conduct of policy appropriately in the, in the current context? Yeah. Reasonable framework. Um, but you know, it's like you said, we're at three basis points on the yield curve. We're right at a razor's edge here. Uh, it could easily tip into, it could go negative today. Right. Uh, so I, I think they're useful metrics, but, uh, a lot more script to be written as you, yeah, as you suggest. Right. But if you were writing a script, you'd say, uh, please, Mr. Bond Market, give me three basis points on the 10 year, two year spread. That's what I'd want. I'd say, give it to me and give me 2.2% on the one year, five year forward. I mean, that's what I would write on a, if someone came to me and said, what would I want, you know, today, given what we need to achieve here, I'd write those two numbers down and, and they've got it. Right oh, now. yeah. If we could hold here, yeah. Right, then sure, that yeah, yeah. simplifies yeah. The, the policy dramatically, right? This is, yeah, right. This is the sweet spot, right? Yeah, you're skeptical we can hold it here. I, I hear you. Yeah, and that's yeah. reasonable. But, you know, right now, as of today, it feels like it's exactly where you'd want to be. And, yeah. and even, yeah. even, other, even other financial market measures that, you know, I would be looking at to gauge as policy 
appropriate? Am I am I balancing these these two these things to you know appropriately? Like the stock market, the stock market's down 20, 25 percent from the all-time high. I I say that okay, that seems about right where I'd want it to be down because I, again, I want the economy to slow. I need to take some steam out of this economy. We're creating 400,000 jobs a month. That's too many. We're going to blow past full employment. So oh, how do I do that? I raise rates and you know it, it comes out of the housing market. It comes out of the equity market, which affects consumer spending by high income consumers. Down 20, 25, that feels, you know, that was, by the way, the stock market was up 20% last year. So we're, all, we're back to where we were two years ago. So that feels about right to me, right? Anyone based on based on the valuation ratios, right? PE or yeah, it's like the cyclically adjusted PE, right? It had to, it was overvalued, certainly. So yeah, hey, Garab, this frame I just laid out and all the numbers, does this resonate in the European context, the UK, or East, uh, you know, the uh, con continent, the uh, how people are thinking about it in Europe? Probably less so. Uh, Less so. I don't think you get that meaningful signal out of two stands. Um, you do get a, I mean, you do you, you do get meaningful signals out of I think it's the five year five year forwards, and central banks will be looking at those. So in the euro area, I think that's the five year five year forward is now just about two point one percent. So again, it doesn't look as though inflation is a big concern for European bond markets, but there are other factors at play in European bond markets, including what's happening with the ECB and, and its asset purchase program and the fact that it's bought up so much of peripheral bonds and what it might do to buy even more peripheral peripheral bonds going forward. By peripheral bonds, I mean the bonds of countries like uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, um, where, which have seen their spreads widen in recent days. Um, bond market finance isn't that important compared to bank finance. There's a big difference in capital markets between Europe and the US. So I guess bond markets don't play such a big role. So what happens in bond markets, what happens to the bond curve isn't as big a deal as it is in the US. So yeah, sure, they look at these factors, but I think there are other factors at play here. Um, and I think, I, I guess, given Europe's vulnerability to the energy situation, um, what we talked about earlier, the possibility of gas rationing, which could be really negative, that would be one thing. And then there's the history of the ECB. It's just been so um, cautious about lifting off. It lifted off last in 2011, promptly went back down again. And since then it's adopted this three word mantra and the three words are gradualism, gradualism, gradualism. And it's only recently that the Hawks have taken over and now they're all gung-ho about lifting off. And we look like we're going to lift off in, in July, but it's just running to catch up now. So that's where this aggression could, could play against the ECB starting to lift very aggressively just as the economy really cools rather dramatically. Mm. And that could really tip the balance in, in favor of a recession. Mm. So the other number, uh, okay. the other number I was going to use was 550 basis points. And that's the high yield corporate bond spread. And you know we're getting really close to that peak in 2018 when the Fed pivoted. So I'm wondering if we go past that, if you're going to see the Fed start to you know take a more cautious approach. You know, going back to measures of What's financial conditions? What's going on? Right. The, mm -hmm. To gauge whether they're, the Fed's calibrating correctly here. You're saying, mm -hmm. look at the look at the uh, credit spreads in the in the corporate bond market. The, mm -hmm. the high yield, meaning lower quality, uh, higher risk uh, bonds of, of companies. That that difference between the difference between the yields on that and the ten year Treasury yield is 550 basis points, 5.5 percentage points, and that is kind of where things got back in 2018 when the Fed started taking its foot uh, off. off the brakes. Yep. Yeah, it started easing up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. But the, 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 Grav, you're saying bond market, not quite the barometer that it is here, just because the, the bond market is smaller, not as liquid, more affected by ECB, BOE buying, you know, their quantitative easing. So it's just not sending the quite the signals that it might hear in the U.S. Not quite strong signals as you get in yeah. the U.S. I think historically that's also you know been the case even mm -hmm. before the ECB started buying bonds back in 2008. Yeah, and I guess the yield curve isn't quite as prescient historically there, the shape of the yield Exactly. Curve. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, okay. Okay, very good. Um, and, and I guess the indicator, the, the bond market measure there that people are really focused on is the, as you pointed out, the yield on 
Italian debt or Spanish debt, the periphery countries where fiscal issues are more of a, a, a problem, where debt loads, sovereign debt loads are high, their yields are high relative to the German 10-year bond, for example. And that spread is a pretty good measure of, of people's angst about what's going on in the economy, the European economy. Right, right. I mean, if you cast your mind back to 2011 and the Euro sovereign crisis, and of course, bond deals amongst these peripheral countries, they were as high as 7 8% at some point. Um, it was it was really, really stressful. And then fast forward a few years and a couple of years ago, Greece issued a 30-year bond. This is a country that defaulted <laughs> on its right. sovereign debt. So that's how much things changed in, in, in mm -hmm. Europe, thanks to the ECB and thanks to that famous statement from Mario Draghi saying that they'll do what it takes, uh, the best, most costless way of saving economies. Um, so now we, we, we started completely discounting any issues that might arise from debt sustainability, the fact that euro area countries, some euro area countries had debt to GDP ratios of close to you know, 150% or above, like Greece was close to 200%, Italy at about 115% debt to GDP, even after the pandemic, when debt loads went up roughly by 10 percentage points of GDP, we didn't really worry about it because the ECB bought all the surplus issuance and interest rates at zero. Now, all of a sudden, Debt, the issue of debt sustainability starts to rear its ugly head again, I guess, because actually spreads are rising amongst peripheral countries and they do face fiscal concerns. I guess a big difference between now and the European debt crisis coming out of the, the Great Recession a little over a decade ago was the mechanisms for the ECB to buy the debt uh, of these periphery countries to make sure that these spreads don't gap out and we don't get into the kind of situation we did back you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, just tremendous firepower now. So yeah, tremendous firepower. Wouldn't, wouldn't really. Would I talk about a European about European sovereign stress at this point? But I wouldn't talk about European sovereign crisis. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty much the way I look at it. I really yeah. can't see that happening with the amount of firepower at the ECB's disposal, and and also EU institutions. I mean, ESM is still there. Um, the European yeah, the, the, the European huge. Union does have this great capacity to issue its own debt. So. I, I just think there's enough firepower there to avert a crisis. Yeah, I guess the way I, I would think about what you're saying is it's a good indicator of this mounting stress, but it's very unlikely that that's going to boil over and we get a crisis because of the ability and, and the will, frankly, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, of Europeans to keep it together and make sure that you know uh, these the, we don't get into a crisis situation like we did 10 years ago. Exactly. And I think if yeah. you look at this... this trickle down of that, of sovereign stress onto financial conditions, onto the banking sector, for instance. Um, it's no way, no way similar to what we saw back in 2011 and, and, and 2008-9. So you know, banks have plenty of access to wholesale funding. They're really well capitalized. Um, their credit impairments are pretty reasonable, thanks to you know, accounting standards. Um, and even in, in the UK, where there were some issues around how banks could resolve themselves, the whole concept of living wills, that banks could actually uh, put in effect resolution plans in distress without having to cease operations. Well, that was a sticking point for the UK regulator for a long time, but I just read a couple of uh, weeks ago that the UK regulator issued a statement saying it's actually quite satisfied with the status of those plans for the UK banking system. So I don't see banking systems being exposed. Oh, and I should mention that while we were concerned back in February around the exposure that European banks might have to Russia, Ukraine, actually all of that has worked out, worked itself through the system. Right. Most banking systems actually have very little exposure to, to Russia uh, and whatever exposure there is has all been dealt with by now. Right, right. Okay. Okay. I, I'm up. Uh, I've got a statistic. Uh, $3.57. Is that gasoline prices or the futures? Fu future gasoline prices. They're that low? $3.57? I thought so. Really? No. Let me, do let me double check. Yeah, that can't be. Because we're we're just under five dollars for retail prices, right? It can't be. Hold on. Oh, that's embarrassing, three, actually. Three dollars and sixty-five cents. Nine X. What? What? Hold on. <laughs> You've come uh, down a ton. They've come down that much? I can share my screen. It's three dollars oh and sixty-five cents. Does that mean retail prices are going to come in here pretty quickly? Mm -hmm. They've been falling oh, I... the last several days ahead of July Fourth. I did not yeah, know so that. So, if you look at wholesale prices, they lead retail. So the prices that we pay at the pump, 
by two weeks. So we should see, you know, a pretty decent drop in gas prices soon. Oh, that's encouraging. So we're, we were peaking at $5 a gallon nationwide for regular unblooded. Where, where are we headed now, do you think, given these, re- these wholesale prices? Uh, I got to double check. It's probably like four dollars. No, not 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 in two no, weeks. No. No 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 no. I mean, if we if we kind of stayed here at these wholesale, yeah, you'll prices, probably get down to four dollars. Oh boy, that that would be nice. That would help. That would help a lot. Um, on a lot of, without be, waiving the uh, without waiving the gas tax, right? Without waiving the gas tax. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> wow, I didn't realize. Well, I knew I knew crude oil was down quite a bit. Uh. You know, we were at 120, 125. And I think last I looked, we were at 105, right? 110 on mm-hmm. a barrel of oil. So I, 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 but I didn't realize gasoline prices had come in that fast. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, well, that's good news. No, well, that's not the answer. Uh, right. Not 3,000. Although, uh, pretty good guess. I, I thought it was, that was an embarrassing guess, but that's pretty good guess. I'm embarrassed that I was. Should, yeah. It's uh, Dr. Copper. Uh, oh, you see the way Chris said that? It was like, I'm so disappointed in you for bringing that <laughs> too easy. Mm-hmm. Did you hear that in his voice? I did. Grav, do you know Chris well enough? Did, did you heard that in his voice? Yeah, I, I, I don't know Chris well enough, perhaps, but I heard it in his voice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh. <laughs> oh, geez. Really? The eye that's roll. The statistic you came up with? <laughs> yeah, that's why he's hiding his video. He's rolling his eyes. He's just, he's disappointed. He looks like a baby in that photo, by the way. I'm just saying. That's probably the first photo that he took when he, he joined Moody's. Uh, yeah, how you get your photo taken and everything. It's good. Uh, all right. Uh, you're right. Dr. Copper. That's the price of copper. $3.57. Wait a second. Is it $3? No, I'm confusing myself. Yeah, it is $3.57. Exactly. And it had been well over $4 for uh, a long while. And, and this is one of those statistics. Remember back? when the podcast started about a year ago, we each called out a statistic that we would follow to gauge where we were in the business cycle. And I think Chris was unemployment insurance claims, UI claims. And Chris, I'm going to ask you to talk about that in a minute. Ryan, you were the 10-year treasury yield, right? Correct. And we're watching that. And by the way, just as a sidebar, I was exactly right about where the 10-year was headed, you know, relative to you guys. You guys Nowhere. I don't know. I don't know if you want to use well, it. We, exactly. we don't have to go down the path. I don't need to embarrass you on this one, but I'm just saying. <laughs> no. Three dollars and fifty cents. On, uh, I was copper, and for anything over four bucks is consistent with a, a very strong global economy. Uh, anything down near two is recessionary, at least historically, has been the case. And now we're at three dollars and fifty seven cents, which would suggest we're coming off the boil. You know, growth is obviously slowing, recession is trying, but it's still elevated. Now that may be overstating the case given, uh, you know, the supply shortages and supply chain uh, disruptions, that kind of thing. Uh, but but uh, feels like that's also moving in the right direction here. It's falling consistent with the slowing economy, but it's not falling out of bed, which would be consistent with recession. Does that sound right? Anyone would, would disagree with that characterization? No, I would agree with your assessment. Yeah, okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. I mean, I'm kind of rooting for it to come down oh, a little can you hear further. Me? Yeah, now we can hear you, Chris. Can you hear we can me? hear you now. So, so um, let me ask, um, well, let's get down to brass tacks here uh, in recession risk. We've, talk, we've kind of been talking about this, talking around it. But uh, here in the U.S., you know, I think everyone – Everyone I talk to thinks we're going into recession. You know, CEOs, CFOs, investors, just friends. You know, go they're going. Oh, we're going into recession. It's almost like a fait accompli. We're going into recession. Uh, and you know, economists are a little bit more cautious, circumspect. But even most, all economists think that recession risks are high here, and pretty close to, you know, even odds. Is that similar in you in in Europe, Garab? Is that also kind of the sentiment there that yeah we're it's almost like we're yes we're going into recession so a lot of people i've spoken to are pretty much of the same opinion as you just described they think recessions around the corner if not even just upon us and over the next 12 months it's highly likely that we'll get into recession i think where the conversation breaks down is when we start to dig into the details and try and figure out what that recession looks like um because clearly we're doing oh so you've already concluded we're going into recession then 
Well, a lot of people, a lot of people I talked okay. to have concluded that. Um, oh. I haven't, I haven't concluded. You haven't, that going you haven't gone, recession. you haven't gone all the way in. To, to the... I, I'm attaching fifty percent probability to Europe going into recession in the next twelve months. Some oh, people okay. I talk well, to think we're nearly there. Let me let me press you. You can't say fifty percent. It's got to be more than even or less than even. Fifty percent is you know. All you're right. saying Let's I don't really know, and I get that. Yeah. But what is your instinct? Yeah. Is it is is are we going into recession or not going into recession? I, I think just... we could. I, th I think we could escape it. Okay. Um, we've got a strong job market, just like in the U.S. I mean, we don't add quite as many jobs as you guys do, but the huge number of vacancies out there. Take the U.K. There are actually more vacancies posted out there than un people unemployed. Now, some of that may be optical because of the way in which vacancies are posted, but it's still very tight. And if you look across France, Germany, other European job markets, vacancies at historic highs. So really, really tight labor markets. So where's the recession? Plenty of scope for, for that to moderate. Growth is weak, activity is weak, but there still is some spending power. We could get through this. If energy prices fall, that would be great. Um, and in fact, there are base effects coming up. Energy prices, you know, inflation, energy price inflation has to start moderating unless there's some really bad shock again. So then that leaves us with something like food, where food prices have been going up quite a lot and we can't benefit from those base effects. So that's something that could hit us. Um, and then we've got the wild card of what else could happen to, to energy, what could happen to geopolitics, uh, how that might affect consumption. So some positives, some negatives, I guess. Uh, we could escape it. We've got a strong job market. We've got reasonable housing markets. We don't have big financial imbalances to unwind. On the other hand, we've got really negative sentiment. We've got the possibility of further supply side shocks, particularly to energy prices. Um, and we've got monetary policy. So if I balance them all up, um, I'd say it's pretty even odds, maybe just over. If you want me to come off the fence, I'd say 51 to 55% of going into recession. Just over even odds of going into recession. Just over, yeah. yeah. And, and, but there are people I talk to who are, who are much more negative than that, who say there's 80, 90 yeah. percent chance of going into recession. And that chimes with, you know, the CRO, CFO community that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here uh, and I assume there, you know, a lot does depend on oil, natural gas, commodity prices. What happens to, with those prices going forward here? I mean, if we've seen the peak in price and they keep. They don't even need to come down, I don't think, from current levels. But if we just seen the this peak and we stay here, you know, for for a, you know, it feels like the Russian war is going to continue for a while. Just say we stay here for a while, it feels like we can squeak our way through. But if if prices go up for whatever reason, that feels like it can be pretty hard to digest, and recession will occur. If prices stay, if energy prices stay where they are, then those base effects will just be a boost. We've got to have inflation starting, energy inflation starting to come down. Um, I, I'm not so sure about food inflation. Now, energy is about 10% of the Eurozone inflation basket. Food's about 20%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an amplification, greater oh, amplification high. from food. Yeah. Uh, and food prices have been going up in recent months, been going up roughly 1% a month. And then in June, they went up 2% month on month. And I'm not so convinced that food prices come down very quickly. There's the We've not only have we got the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what that's doing to commodities like wheat, we've got very high fertilizer prices. And actually, we're not through the growing season yet. So we've got to wait for the harvest, the summer harvest to come through and what that does to food prices in, in autumn and winter. Right. OK. And let me ask you, if, if you say the probability of Europe going into recession is a little over even odds, that means some countries are going into recession, doesn't it? Um, yes, some countries will, at least in that. And again, we get back to what is recession at this point. I see. Um, so I'd say that European recession, if it happens, um, is, a, is going to be a fairly shallow growth recession. So we'll have contraction in GDP for a few, well, cumulative loss in GDP, which could be fairly mild. It doesn't even have to be successive quarterly contractions in GDP. We could just bump around the zero mark for a while. Um, we could see a small increase in, un in unemployment um, and some cooling in house prices. And that, that, that could be it. So we're certainly not talking about a devastating hit to growth and a massive increase in unemployment in the way we've seen in the past. And yes, some countries will. You've got Italy, which is fairly weak. Germany is looking pretty weak right now, um, surprisingly. So 
plenty of scope for for countries, individual countries, to to go into recession. Not really surprising, though, right? Because they're very dependent on the vehicle industry, and that is under a lot of pressure. So, doesn't exactly. Yeah, that's that's one. That's definitely one. What thing. about the UK? If you would, do you think that has more or less of a chance of going in, into recession? Then, then no, I'd, I'd put it as slightly more than in, than slightly in Europe. More. That's 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 surprising. Um, you would have thought that the UK might be slightly better off um, because it imports less energy, but that's not really the case. Actually, UK inflation is running just above European inflation now. There's this tremendous cost of living squeeze that's going on. Um, the consumer is really taking a hammering. So I'm, I'm very negative about the European, about the UK consumer, um, in, mm-hmm. even into Q3 and Q4. I'm not sure the holiday season will help the UK consumer that much, or the UK consumer will will, will support the economy that much in holiday season. Um, so I'd, I'd I'd say it's a bit over, a bit above whatever odds I put for Europe. Okay. All right. Hey, Chris, do we have you back? Are you back? Can you hear me? Yeah. I get. I, I wanted okay. this uh, just to close the loop on something I mentioned earlier. Uh, going back to the yeah. U.S. is uh, UI claims, unemployment insurance claims. Uh, that, that was one of the indicators we had called out about a year ago to follow to gauge where we were in the business cycle. And, right. you know, can you give us a, a sense of what they're saying now, the UI claims? Because I think we need to start watching that pretty carefully here as things slow. Uh, you, you know, that, that would be a pretty good barometer. So what, what's it saying now? I, I, did it come out this week? I didn't see the numbers this week. It did. If my memory is correct, it was 231,000 okay. last week, around there, at least. I think it was slightly down from the week before, um, but it's certainly in that range. And that's that's up substantially from where it was a few months ago, right? You remember we were, I think, down to 185 or you know, some, somewhere very low. Yeah. So you do have claims coming up, but I think kind of uh, hooking onto your theme, again, I would say this is in the sweet spot. <laughs> Right. Where yeah, the, the economy is slowing, we are getting some more, uh, a few more layoffs, uh, but it's not falling apart. Um, and if we can manage to keep this type of level of activity, right, that's what the Fed needs in order to justify its monetary policy, keep it from hiking the rates very aggressively, and just slowing down the economy to a more appropriate level. So if you had to write on a piece of paper, what would yeah. be the ideal number of initial claims for unemployment insurance. What would that be? Oh, so my rules of thumb are 250,000 is the uh, equilibrium. Um, if they get much above 275,000, I, I start to get worried. Above 300,000, then I really start to get worried. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're, we're still below what I would consider an equilibrium level. So e- equilibrium meaning uh, a, enough layoffs consistent with enough job growth to maintain stable unemployment. Stable unemployment, wage growth is yeah. is not ex- accelerating, right? Or again, shooting for that uh, Goldilocks economy. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, good. I I think we're coming to the end of the podcast. There's two things I want to do. One, this an open-ended question to Grav. Grav, what should we know about Europe that we don't know in the context? You know, in the in, the, in given the conversation here around recession. And the other is we, we always end, well, at least we've recently been ending with our, our we give our recession odds here for the U.S. We'll, we'll do that last. But just an open-ended question. What is it that, you, you know, you wanted to say or would like to say that just haven't had an opportunity in the conversation so far, if, if anything? I think I've, I've, I've already mentioned that number, 57%. Okay. And that feels like sensitivity right now. Watch out for European gas and storage. Watch out for Europe being able to, to actually continue to get reasonable supplies of gas, keep its economy running. Everything else we know, if we if we follow the path of energy prices and we feel we're at the worst of it now and it'll soon be behind us, then actually things have to start moderating. Prices have to start coming down. Inflation starts getting better. Monetary policy, if it finds that right momentum, then gets the economy in a glide path. Maybe we have a quarter of contraction in GDP. That's not a, that's not a big disaster. Um, you guys look like you'll have two of those we could be in a good place come early next year. Um, if there is, if, if Russian supply ceases completely and Europe can't sort out alternatives, then I think we're in for a very rough time. Okay, all right. Okay, let's, uh, let's end the conversation as we've been doing over the past few weeks, and that is our recession odds. 
Ryan, what are your recession odds next 12 months, next 24? And has that changed uh, since the last time we chatted? No, it hasn't changed. So 65% probability in the next year. And then I think it was 75% over the next two years. 65% probability of recession over the next year, 12 months, and then 70. No, 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 can't be. You were at 65% over the next 24, right? Because, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it was 65 over the next yeah. two years. And what was like 45 in the next year? Oh, you yeah, should know yeah. this. You should know that. I mean, you should have this memorized. No, I haven't, I haven't run the models yet today. Okay. All right. Probability well, recession models. This is an asterisk. We're not really sure, but you're saying 45% next 12 months, 65%. Yes, that's right. Years. Yeah, that's it. Yep. That's it. Okay. And mm -hmm. that's where you were last week. That's where you were a month ago. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed except for the ISM survey just came out. And oh, what was that? The, it dropped from 56.1 to 53. So we're still above. So the ISM index is a diffusion index. So anything north of 50 is usually signaling growth. Anything below 50 is contraction. But getting to the idea of talking ourselves into recession, new orders is below 50 now. And employment is below 50. So, okay. But you were saying, and this is the survey, purchasing manager survey for manufacturers. You're saying for recession to be consistent with recession historically, that has to be like 45. Yeah. Right? It's get, yeah. We have, we have a cushion. Yeah. We're at 53. We have to be at 45, but you're saying some mm -hmm. of the in, uh, components of the, of the survey, like uh, around orders are weakening more. So orders and employment, probably the two areas where, you know, businesses are worried yep. about a recession or think we're in a recession, where are they going to cut back on first orders yep. and then employment in hours? Okay. 45 and 65. Uh, Chris? So I'm holding at 40% uh, and 60%, but I'm getting nervous because of mm -hmm. uh, real per capita disposable income that fell uh, this week. We didn't talk about that, but that's. Well, we kind of did in that real income shock. That's the real income shock, right? Yeah. I guess we didn't get into the specifics, but. Uh, yeah, that's coming down. That's that's not good for future spending. Mm -mm. Right, right. Uh, okay, so you, but, what what is it again? Forty five and no, what, no 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 and sixty. Forty and sixty. Okay, and that has not changed. No. Huh. Okay, I'm at forty percent next twelve months, and about even odds, give or take, for the next two years. I've actually become more optimistic, not less. I mean, you know, on the margin, obviously. But just again, going back to the theme, it feels like everything is kind of lining up to where you'd want it to be given the circumstances that we're in. I mean, it's a fragile place, obviously. A lot can go wrong, and I'm sure something will. I guess that's Chris's point, though. That's why he's, his, his odds yeah. are higher. He's just, exactly. he's just counting on something going wrong. It doesn't take a well, lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not counting on it, point. but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's zero point. probability. Yeah. That's a good point. You're saying there's some probability something doesn't stick to script is what you're saying. And we're very, right. yeah. yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, we covered it. I think we covered it. Did I, a... Oh, what's that, Chris? Did Garov give his probabilities for US uh, recession? Oh, I, I, I thought that. <laughs> Uh, Grob, do you have recession probabilities for the U.S.? No, I, I, I think the U.S. is in a slightly better place than Europe. So if I'm going to say, okay. if, I, if I give my recession probabilities for Europe, then I'd say 50%. I've told you this already, 50% over the next 12 months, and it's probably 60, 65% over the next 24. So it feels to me like the U.S. is in a slightly better place, not, not as vulnerable as Europe. So it should be about 10 percentage points, at least below, the, below Europe. So you're, 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 you're 40. You're with Ryan. Like 40, no, no, 55 no. or so. 40, 55. That's more, yeah. that's kind of sort of like you and I, Chris, somewhere around where we are. No, but his long term is higher, right? 65. For... But he's saying that's but Europe. That, that's for Europe. That's Europe. Oh, so he's saying 55 oh, okay. for the oh. US. Yeah. For two years. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So he, what he did, okay. this yep. is appropriately, he said, okay, these are my recession odds for Europe. And now subtract 10 percentage points for the US. And I'm at, you know, 40% probability over the next 12 months and 55% over the next 24. That's what you'd be, that's right, Grob? That's what I said. Yeah, exactly. Which is, you know, pretty consistent with, yep. with us. Okay. Well, sorry about that, Grob. I didn't mean to leave you out on that one. No, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you have a recession odds for Alabama? <laughs> no, just joking. 
I know Latvia, right. Latvia, Estonia. By the way, <laughs> yeah. that does bring up something we didn't talk about, and that's Roe v. Wade, uh, which is a big deal. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that next week uh, or in subsequent weeks because getting a lot of questions about you know the you know that the the overturn the Supreme Court's ruling that overturns Roe v. Wade in the response by states in terms of limiting abortion access. <clears throat> Lots of questions about well, what does this mean for the economy? And that's an interesting question. So we might want to tackle that at some point, uh, but not today. We've covered a lot of ground today. And with that, let me thank everyone for their participation. I hope uh, the folks here in the US, uh, that be me and you, Ryan, we enjoy July 4th. Mm -hmm. Grav and Chris, you can you can, uh, you can can celebrate. I'll well. also enjoy, yeah, I will also enjoy July 4th. There you go, very good. Grav. As will I, as will I. I'll have mayonnaise <laughs> on my chips. Oh, oh God. <laughs> oh, no. Jeez. <laughs> well, have a hot dog on us and please put mustard on it. So I'll do that. No, hot, hot, hot dog. Must, mustard and hot dogs. That's that's the rigor. That's fine. Uh, that, you know, have you had a hot dog with mustard recently? If you have not done that, I highly recommend it. Highly, <laughs> highly. With, with a beer, you know. With, with a beer. beer. That sounds like a great idea. It is yeah, Get a brony here, so. if you're in Italy. Yeah. Get you know, I don't know what Guinness if you're in the UK. Ryan, what do you drink? Guinness in the UK. Oh, wow. Oh, sorry. Yikes. Oh, boy. Yeah. We, we just lost our mail. <laughs> Some Pilsner, whatever it is. Some Pilsner. Some Pilsner. Estrella. Oh, boy. Oh, Estella. Boy. Oh, Stella. I'm all for Stella. Yeah. Ryan, uh, uh, then, you know, what beer people drink is very telling, mm -hmm. I find. So, Chris, is Peroni your drink? Is your beer? Um, what is my beer? I've been drinking some Peronis recently. Yes. Okay. Very good. And Gaurav, what do you yeah. drink? I'm a German beer drinker. So I like, I like German dark beers and German wheat uh, beers. That's interesting. And Ryan, my I, wife's I, German. Think, I mean, I think Ryan, I'm, I'm going to guess Ryan before he tells us what he drinks. Bud Light. That's what dry Ryan drinks. <laughs> Bud no, Light. That, that's what I drank oh. in college. <laughs> so you I will did. never drink that again. <laughs> okay. Well, well, okay. What, what do you drink? Come on, man. Victory. I support the local brewery. Oh, okay, that's ah, cool. nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. IPA. Yes, every yeah, I like oh. the IPAs. All right, well, go, go enjoy a beer, get a hot dog. You know, what do you whatever. drink, Mark? You, you haven't told us what you drink, Mark. You know, like most Negronis. <laughs> the Gronies, exactly. <laughs> Actually, I am into the Gronies. Yeah, yeah, and I've been experimenting with uh, rye whiskey or gin. I'm just saying, you know. So, oh wow, aren't you always a big gin and tonic person? Very much so, but I got, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these people that I, I consume the same thing for like a decade. And then one morning or day or afternoon, I wake up, I just can't drink or eat it anymore. And I go on to the next thing and I do that for, for a decade. So gin and tonic <laughs> into my, you know, the, the 2000s. <laughs> my, my, but Negronis, I'll have to tell you, there, there's a lot of alcohol in those Negronis. I mean, I don't know what the Italians are doing once they have the, one of those Negronis. So forget about it, you know, so. Anyway, uh, they're adjusting their recession odds. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Well, this is a wonderful conversation. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and we're going to call this a podcast. Take care, everyone.